For this video, I'm going to dig into the details of TCP connection setup in Teardown. This is a deeper look than sort of the initial service model we presented, looking at a couple of edge cases uh, and the entire TCP state diagram. So I'm going to look at through a handshake, something called simultaneous open, which turns out to be really important today in peer-to-peer -to -peer applications, and actually show the full TCP state machine for connection setup in Teardown. So the high level problem here is if we want to communicate reliably, it turns out it's very helpful to have state on one or both ends of the connection. You can, in fact, turn, turns out you can communicate reliably with having something stateless on one end or the other, but it's much less efficient. Having a little bit of state is great. It'll, it'll make you have much better throughput, etc. But if we have this state, there's this problem of how do we set up that state? What is it? So connection establishment, but then also given the state's going to take, take up RAM uh, in your machine, when can you tear it down? When is, can you sort of garbage collect this state and reuse it? So examples of this, the memory structures you're using for your TCP connection, the buffers, or also the port numbers that you've used. So there are these problems of connection establishment and teardown. So here's the standard TCP header with its uh, standard 20-byte uh, payload and then options. So for connection setup, as we've seen before, there are four parts of the header that are used. The sequence number, the acknowledgement number, the ACK bit, and the SYN bit. So here I'm going to walk through the three-way handshake in a little bit more detail as to what happens in the packets that are exchanged. So recall in the standard three-way handshake model, we have an active opener and a passive opener. The passive opener is sitting, listening, waiting for connection requests, such as, say, a web server. The active opener is the one who initiates the request, uh, the request to start the connection. So in the first step, the active opener sends a TCP segment with the SYN bit set to indicate that it's synchronizing the passive side to the beginning of its stream. It's saying, what is the first sequence number of my stream? And so let's call it S sub A. So you do this rather than just say assume zero uh, for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's very helpful to randomize your starting sequence number for security reasons. It means that people can guess where your stream starts and try to insert data on you. Um, also, it's useful if there happen to be old packets flying around the internet, which sometimes happens. You could have tremendous delay somewhere. If you randomize your starting sequence number, then it becomes very unlikely that some random segment or perhaps a corrupted segment is going to uh, overlap your own sequence window. So the active side sends a SYN saying, this is my starting sequence number, S sub A. The passive side responds also with a SYN saying, OK, that's, I'm going to synchronize you. My starting sequence number is, let's say, S sub P for passive. But I'm also going to set the ACK bit, which means that the acknowledgement sequence number in the packet is valid. Um, and I'm going to ACK S A plus 1. Recall that a node acknowledges not the last byte received, but rather the first byte that hasn't been received. So by sending ACK SA plus 1, the passive side has acknowledged that it received the SYN, which is effectively byte S sub A. The active side then responds. Uh, it doesn't need to send a SYN because it's synchronized. So it sends a packet with sequence number SP plus 1, that's commonly the, what's used, um, and ACK S. Uh, I'm sorry, it sends a packet with S A plus one and ACK S P plus one. And so now it's acknowledging saying, I have received your SYN and I'm acknowledging that. Now this initial packet, the sequence number is S A plus one, but it tends to be of zero length. So if there were a byte in the packet, it would be S A plus one, um, but it's not. And so it's of length zero. This is a, just a, a simple control packet. And so there's the sequence number of which the bytes would start, but there are no bytes. So that's the basic connection setup. SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. A, A plus 1, P, P plus 1, and then an empty segment just for connection establishment. So it turns out TCP also supports another way of opening a connection, something that's called simultaneous open, which as I said is used a lot, as we'll see later uh, in the course, in peer-to-peer -peer applications to reverse things called network address translation boxes. And so the way simultaneous open works is this happens if both the active, if the two sides, we call them active and passive, but now they're really both active, both know each other's port numbers. So the node on the left knows that the port that the node on the right is issuing a connection request from. The node on the right knows the same 
for the node on the left. And so they're using the correct port numbers. And they do this, they negotiate the say beforehand. So what happens with simultaneous open is both sides send sins at the same time. And so here the one on the left sends a sin. Let's call it just S sub A again, S sub A. But at the same time, the node on the right sends a sin S sub P. Well, the node on the left responds and it sends sin S sub A ac S sub P plus one. Similarly, the node on the right responds with sin S sub P ac S sub A plus one. At this point, we've now established the connection. Both sides are synchronized, know the starting sequence numbers, they've acknowledged that. Um, but note that this takes four messages rather than three. So let's see this uh, just a standard three-way handshake in practice. So here I've opened up Wireshark, uh, filtering on port 80 and a certain IP address. Um, and so I'm just gonna telnet to port 80 on that host and we'll see the syn, synac, ac setup. And so there it is. So here's the first packet sent from my host to the destination. And we see that uh, it's an HTTP port 80, sin sequence number zero, um, and there's no ACK sent. There's no ACK bit, and so the acknowledgement field is invalid, so it's not displayed. Now, it turns out the sequence number in this packet isn't actually zero. What tools like Wireshark do, just to make things easier to read, is they use relative sequence numbers. So they show you what the sequence number is uh, relative to the beginning of the stream. And since we're just starting the scene, we see sequence number zero. If we dig inside the packet, down here at the bottom, you can see Wireshark tells you sequence number zero, relative sequence number. And if we then look at the actual field, it's ccbd1dbb. And so it's much larger than zero. Now, what we then see is for the second packet that's acknowledging this, it's going to acknowledge with ccbd1dbc. Here, again, it's using relative act numbers, but that's what we see, ccbd1dbc. It's also sending a sin. So here's the sin ACK. And so the sequence number again, a relative sequence number of zero, but it's 34, 11, 35, AE. So this is from my host to the server. This is the server back with the sin ACK. Then my host responds with an ACK. And so we can see sequence number one, acknowledgement number one. So it's acknowledging the sin that was sent from the server and it gives a sequence number one, but it's a length of zero. And so it's saying, aha, you know, I this packet contains the stream starting at byte one, but there's nothing in it, so there's actually no data yet. So there we see a simple three-way handshake. So now let's look at a TCP connection when there is data. So we're gonna see the SYN, SYN ACK, and then some data communication. So I'm gonna do the same thing as before, except this time, rather than telnetting to port 80 where there's no data transferred, I'm just gonna do a standard web request to port 80. And so here we see a TCP connection. And so here we have the SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. So now the connection's been established. And then data transmission starts. And so here's a packet showing it's HTTP. And if we look inside, this particular TCP segment, see sequence number one. So it's the start of the data stream. Uh, length 474. So this particular chunk of data was 474 bytes long. So the next sequence number would be 475. Still ACK1. And so there's the data that we're sending as there's a request to the web server. Then the web server responds and responds with ACK 475, right? So the next byte to expect is 475, um, but sequence number one. So this is just length zero. This ACK, it has no data in it. This is what we call sort of off just an ACK packet, right? Um, and so it has no TCP segment data, but is acknowledging the data that it's received. The next packet though from the server uh, actually has data in it. So we can see here length 1448, but sequence number one. So it's one to four, one, four, four, nine. And here's the next TCP segment. And then we see here, putting that together, there's the HTTP response, which it's put together. And so there we see the connection establishment. And now the sequence and acknowledgement number spaces are walking forward according to the data communication. So next we're gonna look at how TCP tears down a connection. Like, like uh, connection setup, this uses the sequence number and acknowledgement number fields, but 
unlike connection setup, which uses the synchronization bit to synchronize sequence numbers, connection teardown uses the fin bit to denote that there's no more data sent. So it uses the ACK and fin bits. And so when TCP sends a packet with a fin bit, what this means is that that sender has no more data to send. This is the end of the stream. This is caused when you say call close or shut down um, uh, in the application. But TCP connections, like most reliable connections, are bidirectional. And so it's not until both sides have nothing to send that you actually terminate the connection. Because it could be one side is done, but the other side has more to send. And so it's not until both sides have, have finned and you've acknowledged those that you can tear things down. So a typical teardown exchange looks like this, where uh, we say have A and B who are communicating, and A closes first. And so it sends a packet with the fin bit, with sequence number S sub A, and acknowledging uh, S sub B. B then sends a packet to acknowledge this fin, so acts S sub A plus one. Then at some point later, B decides it needs to close its side of the connection, so it sends a fin, sequence number uh, S sub B, acknowledgement S sub one, it's still acknowledging S A plus one, which then A responds saying, ah, I'll acknowledge S B plus one. So fin, like sin, represents of the last byte of the connection, the way that you, like sin represents the first byte, the way you acknowledge is by acknowledging plus one, with fin, you acknowledge that you received it by acknowledging plus one. Of course, you, don't, you can have also have simultaneous close where they send the fins in parallel um, and the same exchange occurs. Great, so now we've exchanged these messages uh, and we've acknowledged them. When can we actually tear down the connection? When can we actually delete the state? When can we reuse the ports? It turns out to be non-trivial. You can't do it immediately. Um, so for example, what happens if this final ACK is lost in the network? So I've sent fin, then I receive a fin, and I ACK it, I can't immediately tear down my connection because what happens if that ACK is lost? The other side's never gonna hear it. It's never gonna know whether the connection was uh, torn down. Another issue is it could be that we do a fin, fin ACK, and acknowledge and tear down, and then these same port pair, the same port pair uh, is used immediately for a new connection. We wanna make sure that we don't by accident then corrupt the data because the sequence number spaces overlap. So the solution that's used is the active closer goes into something called time wait. And what this means is that if I'm the person who sends the fin first, then once the connection is torn down, I have to wait a little while before I can reuse my state. And so you keep the socket around for two, what's sort of maximum segment lifetimes, or two times or what you'd expect to be the longest time packed segments might live in the network, um, which is on the order of, uh, say, a minute or so. So this approach of two maximum segment lifetimes can pose problems with servers. In particular, uh, if I have a server and it says tons and tons of sockets which are in this time wait state, this can uh, slow things down if the server was the, the one closing first. So there are tricks. You can send a reset um, to delete the socket. Um, you can set an option to make the, the linger time to be zero. Um, another issue is the US might not let you reuse a port because it's still in use. There is an option you can do called SO reuse adder that'll let you to rebind a port number. So this is useful if say you're just debugging something and gosh, I don't want to wait two hours just because I happen to have, have finned in this, uh, in this order. So let's see what a connection teardown looks like. So here's a basic connection setup, sin, sin ack, ack, and then here's the teardown. So because we are, of our, are exchanging data, we have the acknowledgement bit set. So here's the fin, here's the initial fin from my host when I close the connection. And so it sets the fin bit, ack one, uh, sequence number one, ack one. Then the server in response uh, is also uh, closing. So it sends a fin, sequence number one, ack two. So it's acknowledging my fin. And then my host responds with an ack uh, for that fin, so sequence number two, ack two. So here's a simple three-way handshake for tearing down the connection. Fin, acknowledging some prior data, acknowledging the fin, sending your own fin, and then acknowledging the fin. So now if we put all of this together, we can see what the full TCP finite state machine looks like. And so this is something you're gonna come across many, many times. This is well-established uh, finite state machine that really sort of lays the ground for how you wanna set up reliable connections. And so I'm gonna walk through it. It looks pretty complicated when you first see it, but it's because there are a couple of cases. And actually given what we've presented before, it should all, all be pretty simple. So first, we're starting in the closed state. So this is when there are no connections uh, open. You know, I'm just sitting there. Uh, I, my application has not tried to open a connection. So then the first transition here 
uh, to the listen state. This is the passive openers. This is a server. A server is listening for connections. So you can see the action is listen, um, and there's no packets exchanged. If you close it, you then return to the closed state. So this, if I'm listening for connections, I hear nothing, or turn to the closed state. The other transition out of the closed state is the active uh, open. So here's the connect. And connect causes a sin packet to be sent. So this is step one of the three-way handshake. So you send a sin, and you're now in the sin send state, sin sent state. So this is the active side. These red lines are showing the active opener of the three-way connection. So sin sent. Then if you receive a sin and ack, so this is the stage two, you send an ack, and now the connection is established. So this path here, this is the active opener. Now let's watch the passive opener. So the passive opener is in the listen state, and it receives a sin from an active opener. In response, it sends a sin ack, and enters the sin receive state. Then if it receives an acknowledgement for its sin, this is stage three of the three-way handshake, it's the reflection of this step here, then the connection has been established. Now, if you're in the listen state, um, it's possible that you uh, can also call send, which would then result in sending a send message. Um, or you can also, uh, in that way, you're then going to, even though you're in the listen state, you can actively open and active in an open state. So now, there's one more path here, which I mentioned, the four-way uh, simultaneous open, which is this. And so this is when both sides have sent sin. So we're just looking at one side of the connection. And in response to a sin, you get a sin from the other side. And so this is the two sins crossing. So in response, you send sin plus ack, sin received, then you ack. And so there's the four messages. Each has sent a sin, each has received a sin, um, and then uh, received a sin, they send a sin ack, and then there's an ack and data exchange can occur. And so now we're in the established state. Now, of course, you can always transition out with respect to closes and resets. But so now at this point, we've gone through connection establishment. Now we're going to go into connection teardown. And so there are two cases here. One is that if we're the active closer, here, we call close. That results in a fin message being sent, a fin packet with a fin bit. We now enter a fin wait one. The other is if we receive a fin, then we acknowledge it. Um, and we're now in the passive close state where the other side is closed. And then we call, when we actually call close, we'll send fin, send the last act, and be closed. And so here, close wait is we are still allowed to send data right until we call close. So this is the other side has closed, but we haven't. So now, when close is called, we're in the fin one state. And there are a bunch of transitions out of that. One is that we receive a fin. So we've sent a fin, we received a fin. So this is the example I showed with the TCP teardown. So we've sent a fin, we receive a fin, we acknowledge it, we're now in the closing state, we then transition to time wait. Another is that we receive uh, a fin plus an ack. So we can just acknowledge that and enter time wait. The final one is that we receive an ack um, but no fin. So this is, we have closed our side of the connection, the other side hasn't. And so it's sort of the, this state here is correlated with this state here. Then when we do receive the fin, we acknowledge it and enter the time wait state. And then we have the time up before we can actually close and recover the state. So you can ask, what's the difference between this transition to closing and cl time wait? The reason is that this transition to closing is when the two fins pass each other. So I send a fin, the other side fin sends me a fin, but hasn't acknowledged my fin. This is the difference between fin slash ack and fin plus ack slash ack. And so then I wait for that fin to be acknowledged and then transition to time wait. So this is the full TCP finite state machine. It looks really complicated. I mean, it does have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 states. But when you realize it breaks into these two parts, connection establishment, connection teardown, and really there's just a bunch of different possible ways the fins can be exchanged, it's actually not that complicated. And so I encourage you to open up Wireshark and just open up a couple of web connections or see what, what's happening with your TCP connections. And you'll be able to see how those different connections are traversing this finite state machine.